Good. Welcome to the House Committee on Corporations. Today is Wednesday, April 28th. We are in the House Lounge of the State House. Will the clerk please call the roll? Chairman Solomon? Here. First Vice Chair Bryan. Second Vice Chair Caldwell? Present. Chairman Casey? Whip Chippendale? Present. Representative Fenton Fung? Present. Representative Hawkins? Whip Kazarian? Here. Speaker Pro Tem Kennedy? Present. Deputy Speaker Lima? Representative Stephen Lima? Present. Representative Phillips? Present. Representative Potter? Present. Chairwoman Serba? Here. Representative Shalcross Smith? Present. Chairman, there is a quorum. All right, we have six bills on the calendar today. Uh, the first three bills we'll take up together. House Bill 6233 by Representative Morgan, an act to vacate the forfeiture revocation of charter of River Bend Condo, Minium uh, Homeowners Association Incorporated as well as Senate Bill 811 by Senator Coyne, an act to vacate the forfeiture revocation of the Charter of Mother's Morning Owl, LLC, and Senate Bill 816 by Senator Savenny, uh, which would enact to vacate the forfeiture revocation of the Charter of Fragile, LLC. Uh, okay. each, so that we'll move for a bundle. Uh, so. Uh, Speaker Pro Tem Kennedy moves to bundle those those three bills. Second. Seconded by Vice Chair Caldwell. Will the clerk please take the roll? Chairman Solomon? Yes. First Vice Chair, I'm sorry, Second Vice Chair Caldwell? Yes. Whip Chippendale? Pres uh, yes. <laughs> Representative <laughs> Fenton Fung? Yes. Representative Kazarian, uh, Whip Kazarian? Yes. Speaker Pro Tem Kennedy? Yes. Uh, Representative Lima? Yes. Charlene. Oh, Deputy Speaker Lima. Good. Representative Stephen Lima. Yes. Representative Phillips. Yes. Representative Potter. Yes. Chairwoman Serpa. Yes. Representative Shell Crossmith. Yes. And Chairman, uh, the motion passes 12 to 0. All right. I, I'd like to vote also. Representative okay. O'Brien. First Vice Chair O'Brien. Yes. Okay. Motion passes 13 to 0. All right, so now I will ask for a motion to pass the bundle made by Speaker Pro Temp Kennedy, seconded by Representative Phillips. Will the clerk please call the roll? Chairman Solomon. Yes. First Vice Chair O'Brien. Yes. Se second Vice Chair Caldwell. Yes. Whip Chippendale. Aye. Representative Fenton Fung. Aye. Whip Kazarian. Yes. Speaker Pro Temp Kennedy. Yes. Deputy Speaker Lima. Yes. Stephen Lima. Yes. Representative Phillips. Yes. Representative Potter. Yes. Chairwoman Serpa. Yes. And Representative Shalcross Smith. Yes. And now the motion passes 13 to 0. All right. So the bundle passes and we'll go to the House floor. So the first bill we have up today is House Bill 6216 by Deputy Speaker uh, Lima. And Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, can I uh, have a motion to hold the remainder of bills for further Second. study? Made by Speaker Pro Tem Kennedy, seconded by Whip Kazarian. Will the clerk please take the roll? Chairman Solomon. Yes. First Vice Chair O'Brien. Yes. Second Vice Chair Caldwell. Yes. Uh, Whip Chippendale. Aye. Rep Representative Fenton Fung. Aye. Whip Kazarian. Yes. Speaker Pro Tem Kennedy. Yes. Deputy Speaker Lima. Yes. Stephen Lima, Representative Lima, Stephen Lima? Yes. Representative Phillips? Yes. Representative Potter? Yes. Chairwoman Serpa? Yes. And Representative Shalcross Smith? Yes. And again, the motion to hold for further study passes 13 to 0. All right, the remainder of bills will be held for further study. So the first bill we'll take up is House Bill 6216 by Deputy Speaker Lima. And this would change the name of the TF Green Airport to. The TF Green State Airport to the Providence TF Green International Airport. Uh, I don't see any witnesses on this bill. Is uh, Deputy Speaker Lima, would you like to speak on this? Yes. All right. You may go ahead. Okay, renaming the airport started, um, well, let me put my thing up, four years ago uh, when Raya wanted to name it the Rhode Island. International Airport, and I fought to have them keep TF Green in it. I felt it was very important to keep, because of its history and because of the great man that he was, TF Green in there. Uh, they would not compromise. I uh, tried to keep Green in there, having a dual meeting. They would not compromise. We ended up killing both bills. 
Uh, then the speaker asked me the following year to put in uh, legislation, the Rhode Island TF Green International Airport, but then that failed. Having looked at the names of airports, though, we would be totally foolish and a joke to name it the Rhode Island TF Green International Airport. There are over 5,000 airports in this country. Not one, not one is named after a state. They are all named after a destination. And that is done for a reason, because that is how people fly. Providence is the metro region that it is known for. If you Google airports, they even refer to it as the Providence Airport. On your tickets, on the map, it says PVD for Providence. It says it's located in Providence, which we know it's not, but that is the familiar destination to people. The maps, the pilots, everybody refers to it as the Providence Airport. Providence is known as a national and growing international destination, not Rhode Island. And it's not RIAC's job to promote the state. That is up to Commerce or the Tourism Council. Airports promote a destination. Air travelers fly to major cities and their metropolitan areas, not to states. Many airports, such as Boston, Hartford, Baltimore, New Orleans, just to list a very few of them, are named after a person like T.F. Green and are fully identified with the major city they serve, not the city where the airport sits. Many others, like Tampa, Detroit, Cincinnati, to name a few, are named after the major city that they serve not the state the airport sits in. Not a single airport in this nation is named after a state, none. Providence is the core of the second largest metro area in New England. Providence is the higher education center of the state and the Providence Metro, Rhode Island, Southeast Massachusetts. Providence, not Rhode Island, is the historical, educational, architectural, manufacturing, cultural, performing arts, economic, corporate, sports, media, entertainment, and social center of the state and metro. Providence is in clear, bold print on all the major maps, not Rhode Island or other states. Providence is the transportation center of the state and metro with the nation's busiest Amtrak station. Providence is the state and federal government center of the state. Providence is the economic engine of the state with over 50% of its GDP. Providence is the population center of the state with 20% of its population. The airport service area is far beyond the borders of Rhode Island naming it after a state that manages it, uh, or a state agency that manages it, the Rhode Island uh, Airport Corporation, is not accurate to its service area. RIAC wants to call it Rhode Island, which would be just one of a multitude of very, very bad decisions that have been made by Mr. Ithaca Ahmad, the head of the airport. Between losing Amazon, chasing out Uber, thankfully the public got that back, conflicts of interest galore. Bad, bad decisions. And this would be another major bad decision. If we are to change the name of the airport, and I want to mention, I did do this in response to their bad decision of Rhode Island ATF Green International Airport because it will cost money. The other bad decision is to come up with the name, the Rhode Island International Airport. They spent $500,000 to a Massachusetts company to come up with that name. Ridiculous, which I, I will get into 
uh, at a press conference. The bad decisions, the conflicts of interest, the poor way this airport is being run, building an $8 million uh, border control facility for international flights. I called border control. They said they didn't have to build that and spend $8 million. We told them they could stagger flights. How many does Rhode Island have? I think the most we ever had at once was two. We have none now. I have no problem with keeping an international in an airport. Many airports do that. Hopefully we'll get international flights. It's something that would draw passengers. The right thing to do would be to name the airport, if we have to rename it, after the metro area, the Providence TF Green International Airport. If we do not, then the new mistake that will come out, along with many, many others, will show this is a disaster waiting to happen. I thank you. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Deputy Speaker Lima? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. We have as, a, wit we have as a witness uh, Bill Fisher on the line. I thought no one signed up, Mr. Chairman. My apologies. Bill Fisher had signed up. Uh, okay. Bill, you may proceed with your testimony. And if you could shut off the volume in the background. I just, uh, just did, uh, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> members of the committee, thank you for your time this evening. I had testified on this subject matter related to another bill a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to go as quickly as I can. I am Bill Fisher. I'm here on behalf of the Rhode Island Airport Corporation, and I'm here to respectfully oppose 6216. First of all, a little history. We're in year four. In 2018, RIAC commissioned a poll, which did not cost $500,000 and 609 Rhode Islanders were polled. They supported geographic renaming of the airport, uh, and they supported Rhode Island International Airport at the time. Our airline partners supported it. The House, in fact, passed the bill, and the Senate did not. Uh, in that poll that we commissioned, 64% of Rhode Islanders believed a new name the new name of Rhode Island International Airport, because that's what we had put in the poll at the time, was best for the economy. 62% of those Rhode Islanders believed it was the best name to represent the destination to inbound travelers. So even though we had poll tested Rhode Island International Airport, they believed Rhode Island was the best name overwhelmingly to represent this destination, which is our beautiful state of Rhode Island. And uh, I think it's okay to be first uh, respectfully to members of the committee and the, and the bill sponsor. Uh, we're not Texas with Houston and Dallas, and we're not even Pennsylvania that has Harrisburg International Airport and Philadelphia International Airport um, and Pittsburgh International Airport because they have specific geographic regions in the state. Or there's many folks that are associated with the Newport Tourism Bureau who think they're the epicenter of Rhode Island, and it should be Newport. Uh, international Airport. Um, in 2019, we stopped fighting about this bill. We compromised. We worked with Representative Lima, who at the time sponsored Rhode Island uh, TF Green International Airport. We worked with the Senate. And in 2019, the Senate actually passed the bill and the House didn't. 2020, COVID. We don't have to get into that. It's 2021. We're in year four. And we know the economy is has taken a hit, and, and the airport took a hit, quite frankly. I think in, back in April, uh, passenger travel was down 95%. So we began the session this way. I reached out to House leadership and Senate leadership and said, can we reach a compromise? And if we can reach a compromise, let's move forward, because I think it's important, and the board thinks it's important to do this this year to help Rhode Island's economy and to help Rhode Island's tourism. And we, in fact, reached a compromise. We reached a compromise with Speaker uh, Zakarji, and we reached a compromise with uh, Senate Majority Leader McCaffrey on Rhode Island Tia Green International Airport. Again, we compromised. We found a balance between rebranding the airport to better position the airport uh, while respecting 
uh, our history in PF Green, and I'll give a lot of credit uh, to Representative Lima uh, for being such a strong advocate on that. I'm also pleased to report as a byproduct of this compromise that the Senate passed the version of the bill last night, 33 to 1, in support of Rhode Island TF Green International Airport. Of the 376 primary mainland airports in the country, as defined by the FAA, and that means airports servicing more than 10,000 passengers annually, only 32, including TF Green, do not have a city, a region, or a state in its name. So we are truly an outlier. I'll close by saying, we know COVID has hurt the economy. We know it's hurt tourism. This is a small change, but we believe it will help. Uh, it will not cost the state a dime. No taxpayer money will be used for signage change anywhere. How does that happen? It happens very simply because airports, by their very existence, have to be self-sufficient by federal law, which means we operate based off of the rev revenues we derive of operating the airport. We are not in Rhode Island state budget. We do not have an appropriation in the Rhode Island state budget. Now is the time to do this. Travel is making a comeback. People want to get on planes. Routes are returning to the airport. Delta has returned. They've brought back their Atlanta and Minnesota route. And I'm very hopeful that we have more promising news on the horizon. Lastly, I would point out that the Rhode Island Chamber, uh, the Providence Chamber supports Rhode Island TF Green International Airport, as does uh, the Providence Lower Convention Center Bureau. The building that you see in tonight is built on compromise. We have compromised. We respectfully ask that you support uh, this compromise agreement of Rhode Island TF Green International Airport. Let us get to work uh, rebranding the airport and helping the tourism economy and positioning for the summer tourism season. And I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Are there any questions for the witness? I see that yes, Deputy Mr. Speaker Chair. Lima has her hand up. Deputy Speaker Lima. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I had a couple of questions. Hi, Bill. Um, Bill, were you in the Corporations Committee four years ago when Mr. Savage, the head of the airport corporation, testified, and I asked him if he spent $500,000 to an out-of-state company to come up with the name, and he answered yes. So was he not being truthful then? Mr. Savage is an honorable man, and I'm proud to know him, and I'll have to look back at the context of that question and answer. We did not spend $500,000 to rebrand the airport. Not to come up with the name, because that's what Mr. Savage told the committee. Okay, I'll move on. Um, Bill, um, I request, could you send me the poll that you sent out so that I can I see... The question I will send it to you right after this hearing. I'm going to email it to your legislative uh, email address. And I, I can tell you it's obviously dated, Representative, because we, we had tested certain things that don't exist. We're going back to 2018 here. But, uh, but I will send that to you at the conclusion of this hearing. Bill, if I can just okay. interrupt for a moment. Bill, can you, email, can you email that to the uh, committee members individually as well? I will. Thank you. All right, you may and, continue. Uh, two, two last questions. Um, Mr. Fisher, Bill, um, are you aware that the Senate did not have a dupe of calling the airport after Providence when they were working on this bill, nor did the Providence Chamber have any knowledge of this legislation? I, I can't speak to whether there was a companion bill in the Senate, Representative. If that's introduced, so be it. I can speak to the start of this session and the compromise uh, language we agreed to uh, with the Speaker of the House and with uh, Senate uh, Majority Leader McCaffrey. So are you saying, Bill, that um, the rank and file have no input? You just go to the two leadership before even hearings on the legislation and get a compromise on the heck with the rank and file? After 20 years in the building, I have an enormous respect for uh, the legislative process. But in year four, and entering year four in a post-COVID world or a during COVID world, I thought it was position, uh, important that we start the session by not continuing to argue about this. And if there was disagreement between House and the Senate leadership and there, no compromise could be achieved, if that were the case, 
then my recommendation was to Ryak to not even put the bill in. Right anymore. Just have two people on. Okay, I guess the rest of the reps we shouldn't have to run anymore during the pandemic. Um, you now, said look, that I have, representative, I have great respect for you and your passion for the subject matter, and I have complimented you tonight because, and I and I mean this, you you held steadfast to protect what you thought was important, which is Rhode Island's history. We have a disagreement this year on the name, but that doesn't mean I don't respect you or respect the process. Thank you, Bill. Um, one last thing. You said no taxpayer money would be used to change the name. I assume you're going to get that from the people who buy tickets for the airplane. They happen to be right. taxpayers and the ones that fly in and out of here are mostly Rhode Island taxpayers or out-of-state taxpayers with federal money. So to say we, it's we, not coming from the taxpayers, you're going to take it out of the ticket money, I think is a little disingenuous. There is a cost to it. That's my no point. No doubt there's a cost to it, but I don't want any taxpayer listening tonight to think that there's going to be a line item in your budget where they have to pay taxes to pay for it. We survive on our fees by federal law we have to be self-sufficient that means landing fees all the fees we charge go back into the airport to run the airport the airport is well managed our bonding rating is strong our cash position is strong every audit that comes back says the airport is well managed and we uh, are able to absorb the cost of the sign exchange Right. Okay, so you're probably going to have to change your fees because, you know, that same year, I don't understand why when you wanted to change the name of the airport and it was doing so well that you wanted to raise the jet fuel tax and Southwest was going to pull out of here, but I then would have been the highest. The airlines were going crazy. If you're doing so well, why do you chase major airlines out? All right, are, there, are there any other questions uh, from the committee members in the, the room on this? All right, seeing none. Um, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 6216. Next, we're going to go to House Bill 6246 by Representative Clark Carson. Uh, this would create electronic book licenses for all public, private, academic, and educational libraries, allowing libraries to provide access to electronic books with violation deemed unfair, deceptive trade practice. Representative Carson, would you like to proceed? Thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes. Super, great. Okay. Uh, thank you for hearing this bill tonight. Um, it's kind of an interesting topic, and I'm looking forward to a robust conversation about this. I forwarded to all of you several newspaper articles that I found uh, in March, just in a reading online, and I learned that there really seem to be some issues around the distribution uh, of electronic digital books to schools and libraries. And I think that, uh, you know, the digital world has really taken over our lives. I'm sure we all uh, enjoy it in some ways, and in other ways, we're kind of conscious of it as to how it's affecting our lives, and particularly, particularly what we're doing right here. I mean, here we are online having hearings. So our, our lives have changed and become really dependent and dominant upon digital access. And it seems as though, um, books that are being distributed to schools and libraries may be costing uh, taxpayers a fair amount of money. So what I'd like to do is talk about schools first. Uh, what, what I understand is happening in schools, and I look forward to other testimony this evening, is that in some respects our schools are starting to rent books rather than buy books. And what that means is that there, if, you know, 30, 40 years ago, if uh, students were going to read Catcher in the Rye or they were going to read another book, uh, you know, The Diary of Anne Frank, uh, the school would buy 30 or 40 copies and they would be able to use those copies for 10 or 20 years as folks went through the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. But what seems to be happening now is that each year schools have to pay for the books that are being used by the students. So instead of buying one hard copy that lasts, say, 10 years to have multiple classes use them over time, schools are beginning to have to start to pay every year, which I think is going to begin to cost our schools money. And so it seems as though we're renting books rather than buying books. And we're ending the concept of book ownership. 
where there would be books in a school library. That, that it seems as though we're on that track. Um, schools can only rent the books until they expire. So if a school rents the diary of Anne Frank for the sixth graders for the school year, they're only good for a certain amount of time. They don't have them anymore, and they have to re-rent them again. Um, schools, as you may know, have very limited uh, software on them because they want to make sure that the students are really just using the programs that are designed for educational purposes. So schools don't have a lot of cho choices as to where they can get these books. Uh, you know, the, the kids used, you know, all the Chromebooks last year during COVID, and there's a very narrow window for students, and we understand the reasons why uh, RIDE and our school districts do that. So that limits the capacity for schools to shop around to get, uh, at, to, get to rent these school books, uh, and that's a concern also. So that, that creates a situation where there's very limited opportunity for schools to negotiate and to figure out the most uh, economic way to buy these books or rent them. Uh, they create what's called single-user single access for a very uh, limited time. And I think that, you know, I think it's important that we have a conversation about this this year uh, and, and actually try to determine what's going on and how it's affecting our schools. The other uh, stakeholder group that's being affected by this are our libraries. Um, so libraries sort of have the same problem. They have found in Massachusetts that some libraries are paying five times the price for digital books than they would if they bought the paper book. They have found the folks that the Library Association in, in Massachusetts, I think they made reference to that in the article I sent you, they found that there's, it's just a tremendous markup on these digital books. And they're time limiting the access to the books. Uh, you can only lend them out, you know, for either 26 or 52 lends a year, and then you have to buy it again. Um, there seems to be a limitation on when libraries get new releases, and I know that we, I'm hoping we have some libraries that are going to testify. You know, they, they, they can't seem to get, um, they can't seem to get the new releases quickly. They, they get them later on. And, and libraries don't really have any power to negotiate. I mean, what started as a really good idea, getting these digital books, is a little bit turning into a monopoly that that's the only place you can get them because that's where people are reading. And they can really, there's no control over uh, what kind of cost this is going to be to our libraries. Um, at the Rhode Island Library Association has 50 libraries. Uh, and I think we have to think about long term what the impact is going to be on libraries getting these digital books. So uh, I, you know, this bill really looks to uh, require reasonable terms. Uh, we don't want to deprive authors or publishers of their co compensation. Uh, you know, they deserve to be paid for their books. Uh, we're not, we don't want to transfer ownership. Uh, we don't want to transfer exclusive rights to libraries or schools, but we really want to come up with a way to come up with a, a, a reasonable price. We want to require a reasonable price on, on these digital books for our schools and our libraries, because ultimately the taxpayer is going to be paying for it. And I think we know that schools and libraries are somewhat the anchor institutions in our, in our communities, and I think we have to look out for uh, you know, making sure that they're really serving our citizens and our constituents. Now, there's a couple other states that are looking into this. I can tell you that in March of 2021, Maryland passed a similar bill. I can tell you that New York is looking at drafting uh, a similar bill. Uh, I can tell you that we will hear from some of the opponents of the bill that will say that the bill is unconstitutional. We're going to hear a lot about the licensing of the bills from the opponents. And what I have to say on that is we have to figure out a way to solve this problem. Um, we have lawyers uh, for, the, for the committee here who I'm willing to work with. We have lawyers in Ledge Council who I'm willing to work with. And I think that if there's you know, tremendous opposition by the publishers and the distributors of these digital books, then we have to look at a way to really have a conversation about how to fairly distribute these books to students uh, to colleges, to libraries, without really charging a lot of money and making sure they have access to these uh, books. So that's what this bill is about, uh, requiring reasonable ter terms. 
uh, not transferring ownership, and not depriving the authors of compensation. Chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairwoman Carson, uh, you said that the state of Maryland has passed this bill, or yes, passed this. Uh, they have. Yes, they have. All right. Do you know they if it's it a, in March. Do you know if it's a substantial? I mean, is it the same language or? That's a good question. Uh, this is what I can read to you. The Maryland legislature became the first state to pass legislation that would ensure libraries can license e-books and other digital literary content that's available to consumers. It's a strong sign of support. Uh, it would require a publisher who offers to license an electronic library product to the public to also offer to license the product to public libraries in the state on reasonable terms that would enable public libraries to provide library users with access to the electronic literary product. That's right out of their legislation, and I can get more for the committee if they want it. That would be great if you could provide a copy of the legislation to the committee. And uh, also, if you've heard as if the uh, legislation had been challenged by anyone. Not as it yet. I, I don't think, I don't, that's a good question. And I, when I, re I read about it several times, and as recently as today, I didn't see a challenge to it. Great. Are there any questions for the sponsor? I Representative, oh, uh, <laughs> Deputy Speaker Lima. Well, um, Part of it is a statement. I think it's an excellent bill. Representative Carson, I was a classroom teacher for 30 years, and when we, we had the kids use things electronically, the enthusiasm went sky high. So I think it's a great idea. And as far as the constitutionality, it's not really spelled out in the Constitution. And that's up to a third branch of government. So I would not worry about the Constitution on this bill. I think it's a good bill, and I think it will help the kids with education. Great idea. Thank you. Representative Fenfong. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Representative Carson, I don't know if you know this or if maybe some of the people providing testimony tonight will be able to let us know, but I, don't, I was wondering if the schools get together, if they're all offered the e-books at the same rate, or do they partner together? Are there consortiums? Same thing for I the libraries? Know. I yeah. don't know, Representative. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, that'd be one if anybody who's testifying later could answer that. That would be interesting. Um, when we're looking at trying to get these guys in a better place. Because I do think it's, there's almost very different issues for the libraries versus schools. Um, when yeah. you're looking at, you know, kind of um, the legal, legalities there. So I appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Representative Fenton, I think we passed something, I think it was Rep. McNamara's bill a few years ago. If the school districts choose to collaborate and buy something together, they can do that. So I think it would apply here. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how they're going to, how they're bargaining together to get like the best deal. Um, mm -hmm. I think there'd be different issues for nonprofits and schools, stuff like that. So I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. First You're up, we, thank you. First up, we will go to Lisa Sally from Ocean State Libraries. Lisa, you're before the House Committee on Corporations. You may proceed with your testimony. Okay. Thank you. I would ask if you could just shut off the volume in the background. Okay, I'm doing that. Should I go? You may proceed. Okay. I would like to thank Chairman Solomon and members of the committee for this opportunity to provide testimony in support of House Bill 6246. I'm Lisa Salee, Assistant Director at Ocean State Libraries, and since 2007, I've been responsible for the management of Ocean State Library's digital library site, which is called eZone. Ebooks, audiobooks, and videos are available on eZone for all library users who carry a public library card in Rhode Island. And all Rhode Island citizens are eligible for a free library card. Except for some author donated content, all titles in eZone are purchased from the vendor Overdrive. In 2007, when eZone was first offered as a shared collection for all, all library card holders, more than 99% of our titles were purchased in a one copy, one user lending model. This allows the license to be checked out and in use by one patron at a time. If there is high demand for a title, we must purchase multiple copies to meet that demand, but otherwise these licenses are in our digital library forever. Most publishers have changed their lending models to be metered by either time, number of checkouts, or both. 
we call these metered access models. In other words, the license is not an e-zone indefinitely. At some point, it will expire and it will require repurchase if we want it to continue to be available. Sometimes when it expires, it is not available for purchase any longer. As an example, Charlotte's Web is not available for us to purchase as an ebook any longer. Often the repurchase of the short-term licenses license increases over time. In physical format, it is the opposite, of course. Usually you can purchase a used book that was published years earlier for a dollar or less in a, in a thrift store. Lisa, we, we've received your written testimony. Um, mm -hmm. All of the committee members have received it. So if, uh, if there's okay. anything additional that you'd like to add, uh, I think that would just be more useful to the committee because we're all in receipt of Oh, okay. Um, okay, sure. Um, so, yeah, pretty much I wasn't sure how that was going to work. Um, uh, I guess the only thing that I, that I could say is that I could, I can speak to um, the way our consortium, you know, does purchase if, if anybody's interested in that. Please, if you actually, if you could. Okay, sure. So, um, in, a, in a sense, because Ocean State Libraries bought into or was an early adopter of providing ebooks for patrons, we actually got in and are grandfathered in as a consortium in, in the sense that um, Foster Library doesn't have to buy a, per, a copy of Anne Frank to have it available for their patrons. Um, Cranston Library doesn't have to do that. All 50 libraries or all 70 branches do not have to do that. We can purchase a copy and it's available for any of the the Ocean State Libraries card holders. After a while, Overdrive um, disallowed that, and so in a sense, we are lucky to be able to purchase in that manner. Um, I'm not sure if there maybe would be any other any other question around we have, that. We have a, actually, we have a question from Vice Chair Caldwell. Not a question. Oh, okay. Oh, actually, um, th there is no question on that. Are there any questions regarding consortium? Okay, Vice Chair Caldwell. Hi, Lisa. Uh, this is Justine Caldwell. I'm the rep from East Greenwich. How are you? Good. How are you? Good, thank you. I just wanted to take a minute to thank you for the amazing work you do with the RIE Zone. I am on uh, that probably every day. I just showed the chairman that I am still on the wait list for several books, um, as I am <laughs> all the time. Um, you guys have done a wonderful job, especially during this pandemic, um, when people could not mm -hmm. go to the library. So I want to really thank you for that. Um, and, you know, I do, I, I empathize, I really support this Bill of Representative Carson's, because when I go on to use it, it is always a wait list for almost every book that people are looking to get. I think right now I am like number nine and 10 on like, you know, out of 68 or 90 people waiting for a couple of books and then they get taken away from you automatically. And then you have to go back on a wait list again to read them, as you know, as you described. Um, so any way that we could make that easier for you and not have to give people a balancing act of, do I want to take this out of the library in two months or should I go and spend $15 at Amazon? Um, you know, people shouldn't have to make that choice. And I just really appreciate the work you do and hope that we can help make it easier for you. Oh, thank you very much. Are there any, uh, Representative Finfong. Just one follow-up question on, on uh, Representative Caldwell's comment too. What's the difference between the, the wait times, just broadly, between physical books and eBooks? Oh, it's tremendous. So. Um, I follow that very closely. So, you know, last year we had, uh, or two years ago, we had Michelle Obama's Becoming. Um, we had, this year we had The Promised Land with um, President Obama's book. Um, I would say that on a, on, on, a, on, a, on a book where there are thousands of people in Rhode Island that want to read it in the library, what happens is they do put a hold on every format they're willing to read on. So they'll put the ebook, maybe they'll put the large print, they'll put the regular book. If they're an audiobook listener, they'll do that as well. Um, I would say that we satisfy the physical format list months on popular titles before we do with the ebooks. Yeah. I appreciate that. Is it the same length of time you get to take it out? I apologize for not knowing that. 
Oh, that's okay. No, so in, so generally speaking, in the library setting, for a typical book, unless it's an express book where they don't allow holds, they have extra copies. You come in, you get lucky, you get it, you go home with it. That might be a week, or that might be three weeks. Um, generally, in the physical format, it's three weeks for a book. In in eZone, our default is two weeks, but any patron can set that to either one, two, or three when they check it out. Interestingly enough, if a patron um, choose it, talking about the metered access model, if a patron thinks, oh, I'm going to read that in a week and I don't want to think about having to return it and they check something out and then they get it again, it does cost us another metered access license. So um, there, is, there is a lot more than my testimony that's very unfair about, you know, about the, the models that we have to uh, live with. Gotcha. Thank you so much for all that info. Any additional You're questions? Welcome. Seeing none, thank you for your testimony, Lisa. Next, we will thank go you. to Stephen Spohn. Stephen, you're before the House Committee on Corporations. You may proceed with your testimony. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, my goodness, I, I must be a little time delayed in listening. Um, yeah. so thank you, you Chair. You, you, you can shut off the uh, volume in the background. There shouldn't be a time delay when you're directly on the phone. Understood. Uh, Thank you, Chairman Solomon and distinguished members of the House Committee on Corporations. I appreciate the opportunity to speak in support of the legislation. I was uh, just, I believe, midway listening through Lisa Salee answering uh, some questions from committee members. And uh, as I understand, you uh, would prefer I not repeat anything that's in written testimony. I'll, I'll focus on a few remarks that are outside of that testimony, if that's okay. Please, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'd really like to, to focus on the timeliness of this legislation. Um, it, the, the pandemic has just had such a profound effect on the public libraries, and I want to comment on um, how, how our relationship has changed with vendors and publishers. And uh, I'll give one example on the positive. Uh, Swank Movie Licensing is a, a company that libraries work with, and they pay a fee for the ability to host movie nights in libraries. It's very popular. Typically, those licenses only allow for limited indoor viewings, but because of the pandemic, of course, that's not uh, practical or possible for libraries. Um, due to that, Swank actually worked with copyright holders to relax permissions and allow libraries to show movies outdoors. I could go on, but I want to honor your time. There are many other examples out there of library vendor partners working with us during the pandemic. Just in the world of library, we just fared that well. Um, worth repeating, you know, our demand for digital audiobooks did spike at 50%, I believe, in May. And even today, even with all the libraries being open since last summer, still remains greater than percent of are in the pandemic. And I just so appreciate this legislation, which um, while it doesn't address all of the issues we face, it really addresses um, two very critical issues. And that is um, one, digital exclusives which uh, such as the Audible exclusive, which only allows consumers with a credit card to access library materials, and the other are content bar embargoes, such as the embargoes we faced from Macmillan last year, where they refused to uh, sell to libraries uh, multiple copies, and in Rhode Island, um, we were only allowed to purchase one copy of a popular new title for the entire state and then wait eight weeks before we were allowed to purchase more, presumably, of course, so they could sell content um, um, in con consumer markets. And I just want to um, acknowledge uh, the bill sponsor, Representative Carson, uh, for speaking so eloquently um, on the issue when she introduced the legislation to the committee. Um, she really did a fantastic job outlining the issues, and I'd be um, happy to answer any questions people might have. 
Are there any questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Next, we will go to Julie Holden from Cranston Public Library. Julie, you're before the House Committee on Corporations. You may proceed with your testimony. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to turn off my computer here. Okay, thank you, Chair Solomon and members of the committee for this opportunity to speak in support of 6246. My name is Julie Holden, I'm the current president of the Rhode Island Library Association, and I'm also the assistant director of the Cranston Public Library. I want to thank Representative Carson for introducing this important legislation. Um, the Rhode Island Library Association has been working on this issue for the past two years. Last year, we submitted a 14-page legal memo to Attorney General Nerono, and we have worked with Congressman Cicilline and his team to highlight these unfair practices with e and libraries. So what I wanted to talk about tonight is uh, the democratic importance of our public library collections, our mission, and how our ability to purchase e-books in the marketplace is being restricted in an unfair and unreasonable manner. So as Stephen mentioned, um, you know, publishers have the ability to refuse to sell e-book licenses to libraries and schools. Um, he talked about Macmillan Publishers, um, which started their embargo last year, but at the beginning of the pandemic, they reversed their decision. Um, Blackstone Audio refuses to sell audiobooks to libraries for 90 days after a new release. And worst of all, Amazon refuses to sell their exclusive e-books and digital audiobooks to libraries at all. So currently, between Amazon and Audible, they have about 20,000 exclusive titles that we can't purchase. So these embargo practices and market exclusions create a world where a credit card is needed to access books instead of a library card. And then it's completely inequitable for people who cannot afford to purchase ebooks on their own. And it just widens the digital divide between those who can afford them and, and those who can't. And our whole mission is to provide books and information to everyone in our society. And we can't do that if we can't purchase ebooks freely in the marketplace. Um, in addition, this, you know, limiting access to ebooks disproportionately affects the disabled community. Um, e-books and digital downloads help those with visual, motor, and learning impairments. Um, approximately one in four adults have a physical or cognitive disability, and the e-books have helped immensely with that. Um, you know, I mentioned in our uh, uh, Ryla's um, written testimony that the General Assembly has the duty to promote and support libraries as outlined in the Rhode Island Constitution. So with this legislation, we're just trying to codify that Rhode Island libraries and schools can purchase ebooks on the street date and as many copies as we want at fair and reasonable pricing and terms. So the right to full library services is something that should be afforded to all Rhode Island citizens, and we ask that you pass this bill on to the full house for a vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions for the witness? Hearing none. Thank you, and I just want to make a comment on this legislation, uh, just in case there's someone who's monitoring or if there are any organizations that are currently monitoring this legislation that may not be testifying in opposition to it. Uh, personally, I don't typically offer my personal feelings, but I feel like this legislation shouldn't even be necessary in the first place. Um, if there are people wanting to learn, wanting to be out there reading, and having the, you know, being unable to do so, uh, I think that's a huge problem. So if there are any organizations, businesses that are monitoring this legislation who are opposed to it, I'm just gonna specifically request that you reach out to these libraries and start working with them a little bit to offer, to offer more options to them so that people, you know, students, kids, adults who are out there trying to learn, trying to read, have more availability. There's no reason why there should be uh, people on wait lists of, of 60 people waiting months, if not longer, to uh, read. So next, we will go to the next witness, Jill Smith. Huh. Jill, you're on the air. You may, oh. Jill, you're before the House Committee on Corporations. You may proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much. Good evening, my name is Jill Smith. I'm an avid user of the library in all forms and a psychotherapist in private practice. Included in my subspecialties are treating people with serious medical diagnoses, debilitating anxiety, and grief counseling. 
Before the pandemic, I utilized the Library eZone as a tool in treatment for many of my clients. While eliminating logistical barriers for engagement in the world in the forms of e-books and audiobooks, it serves as a lifeline for many being able to get out of their own suffering and into the world. As the limitations of the pandemic increased, the use and values for many of my clients and my community grew. Access to the library in this way creates the opportunity for equity for those adults and children who cannot get to a physical library, but want to engage in not only stories for entertainment, but for learning. I first began using the E-Zone as a clinical tool after one of my sons was debilitated for months with an illness. A librarian who introduced us to e-books. While he was homebound, his ability to download his books his peers were reading so that he could talk to them about them and connect to his life outside of his illness was such a bright spot at a difficult time. Some of my clients use the audiobooks for soothing nature of hearing someone read to them when most of their days are spent alone, as a distraction tool for racing thoughts and panic, to help transport them outside of their thoughts and that when their depression gets worse. E-books, which can adjust to large print, are a godsend to those who are limited by a the number of large in-print book selections. Disabilities already limit access to physical spaces and services. I've seen the e-zones level that out for so many. While I recognize this is only a small component of the argument here tonight, the mental health care system is already taxed beyond its limits, with little relief in sight. The library e-zone has served as a legitimate aid for me, my family, and my clients as a true public good, and what a shame it would be to continue to restrict, encumber, and minimize something that reaches far beyond our assumptions. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Uh, last up, we will go to Terry Hart from the Association of American Publishers. Terry, you may proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak on House Bill 6246. My name is Terry Hart, and I'm the General Counsel of the Association of American Publishers, or AAP. AAP is the National Trade Association for Book, Journal, and Education Publishers in the United States. Our members include major commercial book publishers of fiction and nonfiction, education publishers, small specialized scholarly and independent publishers, and nonprofit publishers such as university presses and scholarly research societies. AAP opposes House Bill 6246. Congress, acting pursuant to its constitutional authority, has long established that copyright law is exclusively the province of the federal government, and creators, copyright owners, and the general public benefit from this nationally uniform system of copyright law. So a requirement such as the one that's created in this bill to license copyrighted works to specific parties and the regulation of licensing terms raises serious federal copyright law issues and constitutional concerns that would invalidate this legislation if challenged. I detail those in my, my written statement, but let me just highlight the first of these. State laws that conflict with the copyright owner's exclusive right to distribute under copyright law are expressly preempted by federal copyright law. So to be clear, AAP wholeheartedly agrees with the importance of public libraries as a marketplace for e-books and audiobooks, as well as schools, and our publishers share their mission of broad public dissemination of these works. But we're unaware of any demonstrated pervasive market failure involving the hundreds of publishers we represent that would justify the systemic market regulation that this bill would establish, even if Rhode Island was not federally preempted from enacting legislation of this nature. Therefore, we respectfully urge this committee to vote no on H6246. Uh, thank you for your time, uh, and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Terry. Are there any questions for the witness? Yes, Chairman, I have a question. Um, Representative Carson, we, we don't typically... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, questions. you're right, you're right, I'm sorry. From, I just... from sponsors. You're right. If, um, okay. You're right, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. I, I, I just have one question uh, regarding this. Uh, what, what, is, uh, what are the American Association of Publishers doing to work with libraries at this point in time? So libraries are, I mean, one of the important partners for publishers. They're constantly working with them. 
either directly or through third-party vendors uh, in order to meet their needs. I mean, essentially, these, you know, they're negotiating partners in making sure that their books are widely available and, and meet the needs of libraries. Um, so, you know, this is, the e-books are a constantly evolving marketplace. Book publishers are constantly, you know, evaluating uh, these agreements in conjunction with all their other ingre- uh, agreements, uh, and they're listening to their library partners uh, along the way, too, to be sure that they're meeting their needs as well. All right. Uh, I believe there is a question from Representative Carson. I'll, I'll be happy to, uh, Vice Chair Caldwell will be happy to ask. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I was just wondering if you could let us know how you're reacting to the bill that recently passed in Maryland, which uh, does require the publishers to offer licenses. Uh, yes, I mean, we've been keeping a very close eye on that. We have raised a similar objections there to the Maryland General Assembly as well as to the governor's office uh, as he um, considers uh, whether to sign the bill into law. Uh, and beyond that, I mean, we're, we're considering other options to, uh, you know, to, to make our objections known. Does that mean that there's litigation that will be pending or are the, is the association taking other type of options? such as maybe pricing, et cetera? We're reviewing all options at this point. Uh, so potentially penalizing some of the parties involved outside of litigation is one of the options, is what you're say, saying. Um, I, I'm not sure what you mean by potentially penalizing parties. No, I, I wouldn't say that. But I'm just um, curious at, as to outside of litigation what those options could possibly be. Right. Um, no, uh, I w- yeah, potentially penalizing. No, I mean, libraries remain important business partners. We're not antagonistic to them in any way. I mean, our issue here is, is just with the, the copyright issues that it raises. So any response in Maryland would be focused only on those issues. Okay, Representative Fentonfong. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Terry, thank you so much for for giving us the publisher's perspective here. I have a question. We've heard tonight from several people um, that sometimes we don't get these audiobooks for like 90 days after the original publishing date, or there's only so many licenses that come out. Are those terms that are negotiated on a a book-by-book basis, or is that something you use more broad sweeping, or how do you guys determine that? So I could only speak generally because those decisions are made on a publisher by publisher basis. But as I understand, yes, it is, uh, you know, each publisher is determining, you know, the scope and terms of those licenses. And in, and in some situations, they vary book by book or audio book by audio book. Okay. One of the most compelling pieces of testimony we're hearing tonight, especially when we're talking about from people from the disabled community, mental health, and how important these um, books are as outlets and different ways of of actually coping with therapy. Um, When you hear testimony like that, and we're trying to figure out how we can get better access to people, have you guys worked with any of these specific communities to try to help this as far as a, a, almost as a medical uh, way, or have you heard this in other states as well, where, you know, there are certain things that we shouldn't be limiting, not just from an educational standpoint or whatnot, but we're actually using this as a tool. Has that, have you seen this pop up in other states? Um, not in other states, but, you know, in the international context, we were supportive of the Marrakesh Treaty for uh, visually impaired persons and print disabled persons um, to ensure that, you know, books in accessible formats for people with those specific disabilities would have access to those where there weren't, uh, you know, commercially available or, or available versions there. Um, so, yeah, we do continuously work with uh, to meet the needs of, of specific communities that, um, you know, need access to, to our works. I mean, we're, our, our publishers are, um, you know, want people to have access to the works uh, and to do so in a way that sustains their ability to be able to continue to create and distribute those works. Okay. Thank you. I mean, I, I think this is a really important topic. I'm glad Representative Carson brought it up. I, I kind of echo Re- uh, Chairman Solomon's things like I can't believe we actually have to sit here and legislate this but um, 
it's, it's definitely, I don't think this is the end of the conversation at all, um, and that we need to get this to a better spot for, and I, I, th I think I understand from the different people who have testified today, the libraries might be in a different situation than, than the educational institutions especially. So I hope that we can work together on, on this to get this to a better place, so, but I, I do appreciate your perspective. Thank you, I just want Thank to you. echo Representative Fenton Fung's comments on this. I want to very strongly encourage you to work uh, with the libraries on this going forward. Are there any other questions? Hearing none. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 6246. Next up, we will go to House Bill 6247 by Representative Newberry. This act would create a wine direct shipper license for licensed produ producers in this or any state to directly ship a limited amount of wine to residents age 21 or older for personal consumption. Representative Newberry. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is the first time I've done testimony by video. I'll be brief. This is the bill that everyone likes, except the people that uh, show up and testify against it, <laughs> lack of a better term. Uh, I have introduced this bill a few times in the past. Um, committee hearings always went the same way. Uh, I gave up, but I keep having constituents ask me to put it back in. Uh, I think there's a demand in Rhode Island for direct shipment of wine. Uh, the bill itself, I didn't take credit for the language. I did see comments from the ACLU and the Division of Taxation. There were technical corrections or concerns. I agree with them. I have no problem with all the changes they suggested. Uh, the opposition is always the same. I understand it. It comes from our local liquor stores. Um, I'm sure you're going to hear it tonight. I've seen the witness lists, and I, I know they're concerned that this will cost them business. There was, there's a study done in the state of Maryland when Maryland passed this same law about now, about eight years ago, about, um, I think I first put this bill in maybe five years ago, that shows that this actually increases wine consumption overall. And the reason for that is that it's, it's, it's the mentality of looking at uh, assets. If you want to, you can grow the pie and everyone profits, or you can pretend that the pie is static. And then, of course, if someone takes a slice away from you, you don't get it. Uh, if we can grow the wine trade and the wine business, then everyone will benefit. Um, I know the local liquor stores will testify tonight will disagree with me. There's studies proving that they're, they're wrong. I don't know what to tell you, but at the end of the day, um, Mr. Chairman, we legislate on behalf of our, our constituents, uh, and that's what we should be focused on. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to um, witnesses, questions, et cetera, um, and that's it. Thank you. Are there any questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, we'll go to the first witness. Nicholas Fady Jr. from the Rhode Island Liquor Stores. Nicholas, you may proceed with your testimony. Nicholas, you may proceed with your testimony. All right, we lost Nicholas, so. Nicholas, you may proceed with your testimony. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Solomon and the rest of the committee for allowing me to speak on this issue. There are a few different issues that we're dealing with here with direct shipment. First and foremost, we're looking at liability. Class A liquor store operators have to go through rigorous training uh, with dealing with underaged and inebriated people and allowing the direct shipment takes that layer away. There is no regulation. Even though the packages are saying 21 plus, a lot of these drivers are not checking for licenses and they're leaving packages unattended. That's number one. Number two, there are so many local jobs that we're dealing with here, and allowing the direct shipment is a threat to those jobs. The third issue we're dealing with here is the statute of chain store. This bill, the passage of this bill would violate Rhode Island statute, allowing chain stores to ship liquor into the state. And finally, 
This is a direct threat to the three-tier system that we have in this state. The three-tier system not only deals with liquor regulation, but also the collection of taxes. And I want to know how DBR will deal with collecting these taxes. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time, and I'll take any questions. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, I have a question. I don't typically take questions from sponsors of legislation, uh, but what, what is your question? It's, it's not a question, it's an observation. I would have mentioned it earlier. Um, I've heard this before about the liability issue. I just want to point out, I think it's 40 states allow this. Obviously, the rest of the country can handle the liability issues. So can we in Rhode Island. I also want to point out that we have wineries also that would be allowed to ship out of state. I believe the way it works now, because we can't accept shipments in, they're not allowed to ship out. I might be wrong on that, but it goes back to what I said earlier. Are we going to look at the economy as a static thing that never changes, never grows? Or are we going to try to be dynamic in this state? That applies to a lot of things we do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy uh, Speaker Pro Tem Kennedy. Thank you so much. So for the members of the committee who have not sat through this, as I have sat through this so many times in the past, we're going to learn, you're going to learn very quickly about the three-tier system that operates here in the state of Rhode Island. You're going to learn uh, a little bit about this piece of legislation, which actually came about because there was a decision that was made at the federal level. At that time, a state had to make the decision whether the state was going to have an open system or a closed system when it comes to the shipment of alcoholic beverages. I argued vehemently against a closed system, which Rhode Island is one of only a handful of states that's a closed system. Most states opted to go with an open system. Um, our uh, vineyards in the state of Rhode Island opted, uh, they argued that they wanted the open system. So that was Sakonet Vineyards and, and, and Newport Vineyards and the, there's one in Cumberland that all argued, Diamond Hill, all argued we want an open system. DEM argued this is good for our state if we create an open system. Unfortunately, the decision uh, was made to go with a closed system. Under the open system, uh, a person in California could contact any of those vineyards in the state of Rhode Island and would be able to have a case of wine shipped to them. Under the closed system, anybody who wants wine shipped from Rhode Island must present themselves at that vineyard and physically purchase it. Then the case can be shipped to them wherever they happen to live. So many times if you watch any of those home shopping channels and they talk about the wine of the month club, you can't be part of that wine of the month club if you live in Rhode Island because we are a closed system, not allowed. You, as a Rhode Islander who wants a product, must present yourself at that particular vineyard in whatever state it happens to be located in in order to get it shipped back. So it, it, there are a lot of dynamics that are involved in this particular process but what uh, Representative Newberry is proposing in this, um, over 40 states currently have, and it has not been a problem. Uh, so the question becomes, do we reverse the direction we're in right now and actually move forward with opening up the market in Rhode Island? I think you're gonna hear from the wholesalers and the retailers, they don't wanna see that done. Uh, if you talk to the typical consumer, uh, they don't have a problem with it. And I think Representative Newberry is probably correct in that uh, many of these products that are offered uh, through direct shipping are not offered in the local liquor store, your local package store. They're not available. They're, they're a specialty type product. There's only a limited amount that is, is created each year and, and bottled. And so will it, it, it increase the amount of product coming into the state? Most likely. Um, and with that, it most likely will also increase the amount of revenues coming into the state through the taxation on that product. But as I said, the question comes down to it, what this committee thinks, is it good to open up the market or to keep the market closed? And if you keep the market closed, it also has an effect on our vineyards in the state of Rhode Island and their ability to move product. 
So speak of pro temp carrying up, uh, the way I hear it is that Rhode Island Vineyards, their wines can never be a wine of the month to other Correct. states? Correct. Correct. Will never be a part of that? Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Are there any additional questions? Uh, Whip Chippendale. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, it was mentioned that the, the, uh, the last person who testified mentioned that they weren't sure how we would collect sales tax on this. And um, I think it's important to point out that with the, with the so-called Amazon bill that we passed a few years ago, we have demonstrated that we are able to very effectively collect taxes on things that are purchased online. So I don't see any issues there uh, relative to the state getting their piece of, uh, their piece of uh, Representative Newberry's pie. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Seeing none, we'll go to the next witness, Frank Fede from Kingstown Liquor Mart. Frank, you're before the House Committee on Corporations. You may proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, committee chairman and committee members. My name is Frank Feedy. I represent the Rhode Island Liquor Store Association. I would like to give you, we are deadly against this bill for the following reasons. Rhode Island operates a three-tier system manufacturing to wholesalers to retailers that has been upheld on more than one occasion by the United States Supreme Court. Any bill allowing direct shipment of alcoholic beverages to Rhode Island consumers would avoid that system and put out-of-state sellers in a better place than Rhode Island entities. Rhode Island retailers' Class A licenses are limited by the state statutes 35-11 and 35-11-1, and while possibly not by design, but by sheer good fortune. The number seems to fit the needs. Rhode Island's population has stalled the past few years. It provides for employment and ownership opportunities. Rhode Island retailers face strict reg regulations by so local and state federal government agencies, local zoning boards, licensing boards, taxation, etc. A direct shipper would not have to comply with any protective measures put in place locally. Statewide, there are also regulations enforced by the State Liquor Control Administration, taxation, etc. State law prohibits chain stores and requires licenses to be Rhode Island residents. Federal agencies, including ATF, also regulate in this area. By shipping directly to consumers, out of state retailers bypass regulation, safety, and save money, putting local businesses in a negative position. FYI, a direct shipment lawsuit is pending in Rhode Island. The Department of Business Regulations is being sued. Along with wholesalers in the Rhode Island Liquor Store Association, we are fighting this. The lawsuit has some discoveries done, and now there is motion to dismiss as they contacted out-of-state wineries to see if they ship into Rhode Island. In other words, if this bill is passed, I'm sure there would be legal ramifications uh, with our organization. Class A retailers are now experiencing competition from over 25 local breweries, 10 local distilleries, and over 20 local wineries, all selling retail. A recap. It is a direct attack on three-tier system. It is a threat to retailers' ability to employ as many people as we do. Class A liquor retailers employ over 2,500 people. It threatens our distributors' ability to employ as many people as they do, including salespeople, office staff, merchandise, merchandisers, and union del delivery drivers. The convenience this bill provides will hurt local jobs and will take dollars out of the local economy. There have been... Some instances where direct shipment of alcohol has been allowed with positive legal identification has not been requested upon delivery. Those are the reasons why the Rhode Island Liquor Association is against this bill. Thank you. Are there any questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Next, we will thank go to you. Tom Wark from the National Association of Wine Retailers. Tom, you may proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much. Um, 
Good evening. Um, thank you, Chairman Solomon and committee members uh, for this opportunity to testify. My name is Tom Work. I'm the Executive Director of the National Association of Wine Retailers, which is an organization of independent fine wine retailers located across the country. Uh, we're not Amazon. We're not Total Wine. Any of our members consist of small brick and mortar stores, internet retailers, wine of the month clubs, and wine auction houses. My members are the stores that regularly tell Rhode Islanders that they're prohibited from selling and shipping wines um, when, they're, um, when they contact these stores because they can't find what they want locally. So NEWR is in favor of 6247, and I've submitted more extensive written testimony, so I'll be brief in highlighting a few points. First, you're considering a very well-written bill um, that includes a myriad of protections um, that have been proven to work in over 45, in 45 states across the country. But to highlight a few of these important provisions, it requires that those receiving permits subject themselves to Rhode Island jurisdiction, which gives the state the ability to enforce its laws against the out-of-state shippers. It requires that out-of-state ship shippers obtain an adult signature at the time of delivery. In fact, wineries and retailers pay the common carriers to obtain this signature, and it's not cheap. It costs about $6 per delivery to get a, um, an adult, to have FedEx or UPS obtain that signature, and this stops wine from being um, put in the hands of minors. The bill also requires that wines arrive in a box that states on the outside that contains alcohol, allowing for no mistake about its content. And it requires that out-of-state wineries and retailers remit sales and excise taxes to the state of Rhode Island, which will result in additional revenue coming to the state. Now, it should be noted that Rhode Island is currently losing tax revenue due to its ban on shipments. This occurs when Rhode Islanders buy out of state, buy from out of state wineries and retailers. But since it's illegal to have it shipped into Rhode Island, they have it shipped to a neighboring state where it's legal for them to ship, primarily Massachusetts and Connecticut, and those are the, those are the states that get the uh, sales tax. The current bill, if approved, would largely eliminate that practice and bring that tax revenue back to the state of Rhode Island. And then, of course, I want to I want to address the uh, the issue of the impact on local retailers, um, and whether or not they will be impacted by this bill. And the answer is no, they will not. What we know is that in states where out of state wineries and retailers can ship in, the vast majority of wine continues to be purchased locally, and consumers do this because they almost always can find what they want locally, and because it's less expensive to buy locally than have the wine shipped to them. However, Rhode Island retailers only have access to a very small minority of the wines that are available in the American marketplace. In the past three years alone, the federal government has approved more than 340,000 wines, 340,000 wines for sale in the U.S. And this doesn't count the thousands of older vintage wines that are still in the market. However, Rhode Island retailers carry only between 20,000 and 30,000 wines, a tiny majority, minority rather, of what's available across the country. It's only when the wine lover can't find that rare or small production of wine locally that they look out of state for the wine. And if they can't find it locally, then that's not a lost sale for the Rhode Island retailer. So in conclusion, I hope the members of the committee will, will see the benefits to Rhode Island wine lovers and support this legislation. It's a good bill with proven protections that won't negatively impact local businesses. Now, this is an issue I've worked on across the country for many, many years, so if you have any questions, I'm eager to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Speaker Pro Tem Kennedy with a question. Yes, thank you. So, at the present time, is your name Tom? That's correct. Uh, Tom. So, um, at the present time, how many states are closed systems versus open systems? Rhode Island being a closed system. Yeah, Rhode Island is a closed system. So there are currently five states, I think, that currently disallow winery shipping, and I think there are 30 states that disallow um, shipments from retailers. Um, 
the bills that or rather the laws that are adopted in each each of these states, whether for wineries or retailers, they're always the same. Um, they always require what is essentially in this bill, which protects against minors getting wines, that require taxes being remitted, um, and all the other protections that I talked about and that you can see in the bill. It's been a very successful um, uh, standard for wine shipping across the country. And, and, and at, at the present time, Tom, have you, since we've already heard from some of the retailers in Rhode Island who have you know, have given the argument that this, this is going to be a nightmare scenario, that um, you know, every child in the world will probably end up with a, with a bottle of wine in their hands when they come home from school. Uh, the reality is, has there been any such problem in any of the states that allow for direct shipment? Have, are you aware of any cases where any state has gone after any uh, of the vineyards that have, have shipped the uh, product in? Have they gone after UPS or FedEx, which I assume are the main carriers that are delivering those particular products? Well, with regard to minors, this I can say with some authority. In the past 20 years, no member of law enforcement or alcohol regulation anywhere in the country has ever said they've had a problem with minors getting their hands on alcohol as a result of direct shipping, ever. Now, of course, there have been one or two stings that have actually happened where a member of law enforcement will either pose as a minor or will have a minor order the alcohol and will um, will we'll share a phony license, and that wine gets delivered. But the fact of the matter is, when you think about what it takes for a minor to get their hands on direct ship alcohol, it, it's a pretty significant feat. They have to get their hands on a credit card first. Then they have to make the order online. Then they have to um, show some form of ID that will suggest that they're, um, they're an adult. Then they have to be at the house when the wine is delivered, they have to show a fake ID, and they have to do it when their parents aren't there, presumably, which is a pretty high bar, which is why it doesn't happen. FedEx and UPS both charge the wineries and the retailers fairly substantial fees for getting that signature. So they're pretty darn good at getting that signature. So to answer your question directly, no, we've never heard law enforcement or alcohol regulatory um, boards say they've had any problems with minors getting their hands on alcohol. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony, Tom. Next, we will go to John Callahan from Bellevue Wine and Spirits. John, you're before the House Committee on Corporations. You may proceed with your testimony. And if you could shut off the volume in the background as well. Shut off the volume in the background. Okay. Um, is that better? Yep, you can proceed with your testimony. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that I... I I kind of don't understand why the legislature would wish to harm the businesses in the state of Rhode Island um, by allowing out-of-state um, shipping into the state. Um, currently, the stores in Rhode Island cannot ship to the majority of states outside of Rhode Island, and yet for allow them to then those states to then ship into Rhode Island while our businesses cannot puts all of the retail liquor stores at a serious disadvantage to every other state in the country. And to fail to understand why the legislature would want to risk the jobs of those people in the retail shops and, uh, and all of their employees. Uh, also, I don't see how the state can enforce the excise tax um, since um, there, there's no way they can currently patrol what is going on in the state as it is, and there's no way they're going to be able to make sure that all of the out-of-state stores that are shipping into Rhode Island are, there, are also calculating the excise tax that all the wholesalers pay to the state um, voluntarily. Uh, and the other thing is that, it, again, it just it baffles me as to, I mean, currently the legislature has law, passed laws um, to not allow it, and then there's supposed to be a f uh, $1,500 fine for anyone that 
um, does it a second time. And I had a conference call um, with the enforcement agency, the DBA, who said that they will not send the fines. Um, they said they just don't have the legal manpower to do so. So <laughs> we're already at a disadvantage. Um, and then just opening up the gates makes it even worse so that everybody knows that they can just you know, sh ship into the state. And therefore, as I said, putting every single retail store in the state of Rhode Island at a distinct disadvantage to every other state that can now ship in to Rhode Island, but the Rhode Island stores could not reciprocally ship into their state. And I guess uh, that's probably the major issue um, we have. Uh, so they, not only will the state lose um, income tax uh, revenue, they'll also lose the revenue of the excise tax and uh, with beer also. I think actually this is just wine. Thank you, John. Um, I believe we have a question from Speaker Pro Tem Kennedy. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think there's a very big disconnect going on here. This bill is not all about Rhode Island retailers shipping product into other states. It is not about uh, a California retailer shipping their product into Rhode Island. It is about vineyards being able to, uh, to direct ship a vineyard in Washington State, a vineyard in California, being able to ship the product into Rhode Island. And in so doing, that, that's not for those the vineyards that, excuse in me, Rhode well, Island. John, for one moment, this, the deputy, okay. you had your opportunity to yeah. speak, uh, speak pro tems. The, those vineyards in Rhode Island would have the same ability to, to direct ship into those other states as well. It's all about either an open system or a closed system. And as was already stated, we're one of only a handful, five states, that are a closed system at the present time that does not allow that. Whereas those open system uh, have that ability to ship the product direct. Thanks. If you would like to respond, John. Yeah, I mean, as, as I read the bill, it was it was, it was that anybody, any licensed operation outside of Rhode Island could then apply for a license, but then therefore holds it open to every other retail. If it was just, if it was just only exclusively to, to wineries, that's a whole other issue. But it doesn't, the way the bill reads, is if it allows any licensed, and actually it would even mean a wholesaler from out of state could ship into the consumer in Rhode Island also. Well, John, uh, that's what the whole committee process is about. So uh, the committee will review the actual language of the bill. And uh, if, in fact, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, uh, you know, we can obviously amend it. But um, we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you for your testimony, John. Uh, next, right, thank you. next, we will go to George Zenia from the Al Alcoholic Beverage Wholesalers. Mr. Zenia, you may proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is George Zania. I'm speaking on behalf of the Alcoholic Beverage Wholesaler Dealers of Rhode Island in opposition to this piece of legislation. Um, I, I wanted to start with just one main point, and that's what was alluded to earlier, that there's an active lawsuit that the Attorney General and DBR is fending off right now on this very issue. So as you consider that legislation, I know the legislature doesn't usually make a, a point of entering into the middle of an ongoing legal matter, so I wanted to bring that to your attention. But then on the, on the merits of the bill, you know, I won't get into the three-tier system because uh, Representative Kennedy has uh, given you pretty much the overview of it, but there are three main points that our current system helps make sure happens, and one is the safeguarding of public health and safety. And that's not just about carding at the counter, it's not just carding at the doorstep, it's about training. Previous legislatures have put into statute requirements for training, not just for carding, but for training to understand what they're doing, what the magnitude of serving alcohol is. Secondly, it's also about revenue uh, protection and security in that we're collecting 100% of what we're talking about, excise tax, sales tax, property tax. Don't forget that all of these retailers in Rhode Island, because the legislature has pro prohibited 
uh, it from being a chain store for liquor stores. They're all mom and pop stores. All of these mom and pop stores are paying property taxes in addition to payroll taxes and sales taxes, taxes that will not be seen from out-of-state vendors or wineries from out-of-state. And then lastly is the job security, job protection side of it, where we are employing Rhode Islanders that work in these mom and pop uh, stores and that are um, spending their money in our economy. Somebody said earlier, I don't know if it was the witness from the Wine Institute or where he was from about, well, this will allow us to bring in more sales of wine and more wine will be purchased. That's a fallacy. That's an academic argument. The reality is that you and I have a limited amount of money that we have that's classified as disposable income. If you're spending $10, $20, $100, on something like alcohol, you're not all of a sudden, because there's going to be a greater array, spend $300, $400, $500. It just doesn't work that way. The bottom line is that we are, the state of Rhode Island, and you in the legislature and previous legislatures have built a system that is safe for the public, it protects our health, protects revenue, and keeps jobs in Rhode Island. And I would ask that you vote against this bill for those very reasons let alone the fact that there's an active lawsuit. I'm happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Are there any questions for the witness? Mr. Chairman, may I comment on that? Uh, Brian, yeah, yeah, you may uh, briefly comment on it, but uh, generally we don't take comments from... Just very quickly. I don't know anything about the lawsuit. We've heard a couple things about that. I don't see how it has any relevance to this whatsoever. If the lawsuit is about whether they have a right to do it under existing law, who cares? We're talking about changing the law. Uh, I just want to say I was the one that talked about wine sales. I, there are studies that have shown, and I can provide them to the committee, that wine sales overall went up in states that adopted this. And I'm only pointing out, I understand what the witness was saying, Mr. Singh was saying about, well, if someone only has $10 to spend, they're only going to spend $10. That's not the point. The point is when you increase shipments of wine in, you spark interest in wine, and overall sales go up. So the total aggregate amount of money that gets spent on wine goes up. That's the point. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and Mr. Chair, if, if, if Representative Newberry, could you just clarify what your intent was with this legislation? Is it sp specifically to speak about vineyards, direct shipment from vineyards, whether yeah. they're in the state of Rhode Island yeah, or I, out of state? I, or I'm not looking, I'm not looking, to, to, I'm not looking to allow uh, some for-profit uh, collection of package stores in Connecticut to suddenly start uh, shipping wine into uh, Rhode Island. That's not the intent. Thank you. The intent is to allow people to get wine. Exactly. By the way, let's not kid ourselves. People in Rhode Island get direct wine shipped all the time. I had a constituent, which is how I got involved in this issue many years ago. I don't know if she still does it, who did this as a job. But anybody who is a Rhode Island customer, she simply, I mean, probably wasn't legal, but she basically went and got the, got the bottles and message, shipped to Massachusetts and, and delivered them to customers. I've had wine shipped to friends in Massachusetts. My wife came back from Italy and a vineyard shipped some wine. But she went on a trip. And it was shipped to our friend's house in, in Massachusetts. We picked it up the next time we saw him. So let's not pretend this isn't going on. It's sort of like marijuana in that sense, right? People are doing it anyway. Our, 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 our constituents want this. A very, very narrow group of special interests does not want this. I respect that. I actually think that they're incorrect in a lot of their assumptions. I do respect their concerns, but I think they're incorrect in a lot of their assumptions. That's all I'm saying. Representative Newberry, if you take a look at line six in that first paragraph, of the bill, uh, all that language after wine producer, you know, the language that says supplier, importer, wholesale, distributor, or retailer, uh, if that language was removed, would that better clarify the intent of your legislation? Yes, I'd, I'd be fine with that. That'd be fine. Okay, thank you. Are there any additional? Good. For, uh, George, you may proceed. One point, Mr. Chairman, please. You may proceed, George. Mr. Chairman, I would just invite the, the committee and the sponsor and uh, the longtime champion, Representative Kennedy, to um, take a peek at the briefs that have been filed and that this is a slippery slope that absolutely figures into and would in, um, influence an ongoing uh, lawsuit. But those briefs are, are public, and I'm sure if you ask EBR or the Attorney General for them that you would find them very helpful and that we can say this is just about wineries, but this is a slippery slope. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? 
Seeing none, thank you for your testimony, George. Uh, last up, we will go to Robert Goldberg from the United Independent Retailers. Bob, you may proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Bob Goldberg here, representing the United Independent um, Retail Liquor Stores, uh, as I have been doing for more than 20 years. And I must say, it's very difficult testifying by the telephone. I'm going to miss some of the interaction uh, Speaker Kennedy always provides every time I uh, speak on this bill. And um, I know it's very comfortable in the room and there but I'll try to be um, very brief. Uh, there are the liquor stores in Rhode Island, the Class A license holders, are primarily small, small business, family-owned, family-run, and it's the livelihood for the family. They know their business. They know what works. They know what doesn't work. They know how to operate the business, and they can tell a threat when they see one. Another uh, factor here that nobody has brought up is every year there's a number of bills that seek to take away a piece of their business. Um, this year alone I counted eight uh, separate pieces of legislation pending before the General Assembly and every one erodes the business of the liquor store and every proponent and every sponsor in every wine institute and what. Now, oh, this is a good reason it won't hurt, it will do this, it won't do that. Studies show whose studies show what. We haven't been directed to any of the studies, nor have the committee members been directed to them to review for themselves what studies actually show. But the best study in the world is from the guy behind the counter that owns the liquor store and knows what's going on in the store. I. As I have said many years, and I, I hope um, uh, Speaker Kennedy would recall and agree with this, um, this is not a subject matter that is best taken up in a piecemeal fashion. Well, let's clip them a little bit here. They won't really notice. It'll do improve their business. It'll do that. All these pred uh, predictions and projections, depending on what side of the issue or what the particular bill does. And a lot of these bills, the stores over the years, have been very accommodating and uh, worked with the sponsors of the legislation to reach an amicable solution. Uh, and every year, the store business is backing up and backing up a little more. This is something that needs to be looked at overall from an overall perspective and how alcohol is going to be run and distributed in Rhode Island. I would submit to you that Rhode Island has done a very good job, and that I can't for the life of me understand why people are arguing here to send the business out of state and take it away from local families. Uh, with that, I'm always, I would usually say I'm always around the building and available for questions or further discussion on any issue, but um, I can be reached by the telephone, and I will be down at the building as soon as you guys let me in. With that, uh, that's all I have to say. I know it's hot in that room right now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Are there any questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you. And I know the Department of Business Regulation uh, tracks all this legislation. If they do happen to be watching at this point, uh, if they could provide us with any information regarding the current status of uh, the lawsuit. Uh, going on that would be helpful to the committee's uh, decision making in this process. And that concludes the testimony Mr. on House Mr. Bill Chair. 6247. Uh, 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 Speaker Pro Tem Kennedy. Just very, very quickly, not to prolong the, the hearing or anything, but I would just bring to the committee's attention there have been so many. Uh, Rhode Island was stuck in the year uh, or the end of prohibition for such a long period of time. Many of the people on this committee are probably not even aware of the fact that up until the early 1990s, it was against the law for a liquor store to even advertise a price. They couldn't even say, put the word save or discount in the window of their store because of the, or save, 
because of the fact that, for all intents and purposes, that was a connotation that you were offering a lower price. And the liquor stores for years fought that. They said, we don't want to have to advertise price. And, and finally, there was a, a store owner in Westerly who, who fought it, brought it all the way through the courts, and eventually he won. Uh, ironically, he won, I believe he advertised in an out-of-state newspaper. And somebody reported it to the Department of Business Regulation, and the, and the department went after him. And he says, I wasn't even advertising in my own local market, but it didn't matter. But now, it's commonplace for liquor stores to advertise prices. Change is going to happen. It's going to happen uh, whether we want to see it happen or not. And at some point in time, this may be one of those items where uh, it, it may be time for some change and to open up this, this marketplace. You go into just about any other state, and what do you see in a supermarket? Beer and wine, in many cases. That's not allowed in Rhode Island, and that's not even being anticipated to be allowed in the state of Rhode Island. But we look at what has happened in other states, and we look at what has happened in the state of Rhode Island, and Rhode Island has just barely progressed past that stage of getting past prohibition. So I, I just bring that to your attention. I know Representative Newberry has, uh, has brought this issue forth for many, many years, and, uh, and perhaps um, Bob Goldberg's correct, maybe there has to be a study commission at some point in the near future to look at the overall aspect of the, the alcoholic beverage laws in the state of Rhode Island to finally bring us into modern times. Thank you, Chair. All right, and I just want to point out that we have received a lot of written testimony on this bill. Uh, we've received written testimony against from McLaughlin Moran, Rhode Island Liquor Store Association, Main Street Wine and Spirits, Wakefield Liquors, and Kingstown Liquor Mart, and the United Independent Retail Liquor Store Association. We received uh, written testimony from the Rhode Island Department of Revenue Taxation, uh, not taking a position, but discussed a couple of things. Um, and we received uh, written testimony from the ACLU requesting a minor amendment. And we received written testimony in favor from the National Association of Wine Retailers. That concludes our hearing on House Bill 6247. Is there a motion to adjourn? Mm -hmm. Made, seconded. Second. We are adjourned. Thank you.